Okay, the future of interior design. I'd, I was asked, I thought I'd be a little bit careful. This is not a house, as you can clearly see. Um, I thought I'd be a little bit careful about predicting future. I thought, I think it's not a good idea to do it, and as in the 1950s when they thought that's what we'd be driving these days. So I'm not really going to hit on what is going to happen physically, um, but uh, actually look at the pathway towards getting there. Um, and toward looking, I think we're looking from a viewpoint in, in Europe right now of great design. Um, I think I like where we are right now. I'm sure everybody else does too. Um, what I thought was really exciting this year, and I'm sure, again, was, was Thomas Heatherwick um, with the cauldron. Everybody got it. And yet he was pushing, nudging design just a little bit further forward, just a little bit more interesting and uh, questioning the past, not just accepting the past. And the public have got that now. So um, I want to just open the way towards us getting in that direction. Do you all know that? Have you all read about in the news about this? Have you all seen this? It's quite scary, isn't it? It's, um, it's in Spain, Echo Homo. It's a beautiful, famous um, mural in a, in, a, in a church. And they, um, she decided to help restore it. So we started, can you see from there? She, they started with that, and that's what they've ended up with. And I felt sometimes that when I go and see my clients, I come out feeling like I had that during the presentation, and that's what they get at the end, this sort of rather sort of sea of beige. Now, um, the, way I, the reason I'm saying this in reference to the future is as an interior designer, um, my hope is to achieve in the future more sustainable design. And for me, sustainable design is design that's going to last, both in its quality, its finish, and also in its sense of style, in so much that it's what people need and want and how they want to live, so that they can live with something which actually wears out eventually, rather than being thrown away because it's gone out of fashion. Um, and that's what my job is when I go and see my clients, and I do presentations. I need to know how to present well in order for that client to understand what I'm getting at, because what I'm going to show them is, of course, totally fabulous. Um, now, I thought, oh, there you go, sorry. I thought I'd just kick off a little bit, a little bit about who I am and what I, what I do, tiny amount. Um, all these people are the people that work with me. They're not my team. I hate that phrase. It's just happened to me. I, I founded the company. But we're a mixture of landscape architects, architects, interior designers. Um, we do take new young people on board as well, people who have been newly trained. And also, um, some of the people that you see here I've been working with for 20 years. Um, my company has existed for 20 years. Um, yes, we do very posh houses. I admit to that. But also, um, some of the guys in our office do apply for uh, planning applications for roof um, extensions in Stanmore. Uh, it's a full range of different things that we do. And that, just to get to the point of it, because also people think an interior design is actually someone who just fluffs your cushions. Now, um, I happily fluff cushions. I quite enjoy it. But also, uh, we do start from the roots. I mean, this client actually, when I, she took me on board, said, we just want to change the wallpaper and have a couple of cupboards put into the house. But when we saw her house, and it was doing this as you went up the staircase. And, you could, and I found that the whole of the house was fed by one wire. So it was either going to collapse or burn down. Um, that we took it back to the root. These joists that you're seeing here were actually holding up a marble bathroom, um, and they're totally rotten on the ends. Um, and so it was going to go, and there weren't enough joists. So we, we, I, in my company, and a lot of interior designers these days, who are members of the BIID are, are, are highly trained and understand how to deal with a building, especially in central London when you're working with old buildings. That, that's my logo again. Um, uh, and, uh, but then it does go totally top end, five star Barclay Hotel. Um, now, with this one actually, it was, it was a funny one. It, it's, it, 
it's, when you're dealing with a hotel, you don't have a client. It's just a board of people, the accountant, the CEO, and you've got a presentation board, and you've got to just have a pretty presentation board, and if it looks really nice, you get the project. But actually, they're still critical when it's done. They're still looking at it, see if it works. So what we did in this situation is we create a client in our own head. And what I'm getting at is, is we, we defined a style for that client. We defined who that person would be. In this situation, it was actually Mr. and Mrs. Done Very Well from Manchester, who are celebrating their 40th wedding anniversary and coming down to London to see a show and having a bit of a treat and spending £2,000 a night in a suite. Now, but what I'm finding now with um, things like Pinterest, people are actually discovering their own style. You know what Pinterest is, don't you? Have you seen Pinterest? I'm sure if you're any designers here, you, you, you live by it. It's a sort of living mood board where you can collect images and put them into, um, into boards yourself. And people are beginning to do this quite a lot. They're stopping reading the magazines, but actually, which are leaders of fashion, but actually defining their own style instead with things like Pinterest. We're growing up. Um, um, we've gone out our teenage years where we used to follow the great designers like Armani or just go to Conran because Conran did his shopping for you. Um, you're actually doing it yourselves and being much more choosy about what, what you want, which means that you're buying things that are going to stay and going to last. So interior design is going to move out of fashion and, um, and move on to style. Um, and, and with this place, actually, we were touching on um, an interior that is both quite modern and very old as well. We, we put all the new technology into this space. We took all the panelling down to do that, but we put it back again and kept that patina. And we've seen a lot of projects in the last few years where they've stripped the patina out of a house. They want it to be clean and crisp. But actually, you can mix the new and the old, and I think it lasts much longer. So this is actually freshly photographed. Um, I finished photographing this last week. Um, it's a project down in just off Baker Street. It's a pied de terre for a client. Um, nice pied de terre to have. Uh, it's, uh, it's got a mezzanine front and uh, bedrooms at the back. We managed to get a one bedroom flat into turning it into a two bedroom, two bathroom flat. Um, and, and highly finished. We spent a lot of time with the clients trying to understand what their needs were. It wasn't a sort of presentation board thing. It's more involving the client in the design process. Um, these people were from South Africa. They'd run back to England and they were missing the sun. So we needed to make sure that we had a space that had that lightness and freshness um, and a sense of space, which they have over there. Also, they had a darn good collection of furniture, of, uh, of not furniture, of, of paintings. And so we actually designed the, the space to, to accommodate the paintings for them as well. Uh, what you're seeing here as well is these are entertaining people. They're party animals. So instead of this space naturally being the sitting room, which is what most people would do, we turned it into the dining room where they would entertain and brought the kitchen out into, into the sitting space. There's the kitchen on the other side. Um, and then the kitchen actually looks fairly boring. It is just melamine covered, uh, but it is handmade. It's a handmade kitchen. They didn't want anything that stood out, but what we did have is awkward sizes. So we could totally tailor um, that space to the client. Also, it's not made of cheap chipboard, and you'll be quite surprised how many fancy kitchens are made with cheap chipboard. This is thick MDF. It'll last a lifetime. You see in the corner at the back here, we've done a little installation. We're actually hiring all the wiring going up through the building. Um, but also we, uh, actually I'll go on to that later when we, we get closer, we've got a closer picture, there you go. Um, this is about collaboration. Uh, we, a lot of time we, I spend looking for clever, talented craftsmen. And I found this very clever woodsman who had never done this before, but was willing to pull bit, bits of rough oak together and, and build this column which would connect the two floors together. Um, and we're running soil pipes and wires and goodness knows what through the middle of it as well. So it's doing lots of different things. 
Um, and we've cantilevered a little uh, credenza, chest of drawers, over the mezzanine, so it's drilled through the concrete. Um, I carefully put in the metal bar as well because, um, um, because I have parties. I expected people will actually might, might even stand on the thing. Um, and we've done, if you've seen, we've done lots of layers of white. And we've even done that in the bathroom, uh, painted back glass on the back, um, white, but it's sort of textured white tiles. Um, they're all ceramic, very rarely used stone these days. Um, and they're also locally sourced, uh, the European sourced. And so then we, moved into the, we move into the TV room. The TV room, or library, I decided to call it, because we've got books in it, um, uh, is quite tiny. Tiny room. You can see the width of it. It's literally those two chairs. But what more do they need to watch TV? It's a more pleasant space to be than blasting. One of the things that doesn't work with open plan living is if someone's got a TV on, that's it. The whole house has to live with it. So we've changed that a little bit. Um, and we've played with color as well. I remember the, uh, uh, the main contractor calling me, telling me that I'd got the color wrong. Um, and it was some odd dark gray. And I said, no, no, that's exactly what we're wanting. Uh, and you can see a little bit more of it there. And we've mixed it with orange. Not that I've got an orange obsession, please do forgive me, but there's, um, and we've lowered the ceiling. I mean, we've done all the opposite things that most people think you shouldn't do. Um, we've taken the ceiling down around the edge in order to light up and light up the orange in the middle. Just checking the time. Uh, and then in bedroom, again, it's tiny, um, book matched oak. Uh, and we've made a bed head, which is inspired by, you probably recognize it, the Mies van der Rohe Barcelona chair, um, which we've upholstered in that style, floating cupboards. All of this is handmade stuff. We're in tiny little flats, essentially, in central London. Um, so it is tailor-made, but I know that it will stay there. It will last. And also, because we're using fitted units, it can look a bit cumbersome in some spaces. So what we've done is underlit it behind, just to make the thing float a little bit more. Now, I want to show you a little project which happened 20 years ago. Um, not many photographs, and I'll jump through them. I won't go through them in detail. And it's a project that is so not 100% design. Um, but I just want to make a point about what a designer does, and a designer working to a brief, and also a brief from a client. Now, those clients that you've just seen said to me, we want a big space to entertain in. We want light, we want to commission, we want something unusual, we want something that's going to last. You saw the furniture there, it is all the real stuff. It's not the fake furniture you can buy. It is the Florence Knoll, etc. So we know it's going to be there for a lifetime. Um, I got a very, very similar brief from a client uh, 20 years ago, and I did that. Um, same designer. Um, so, you know, we don't have an axe to grind, okay, as designers. We can work to different clients' brief. We are trained uh, to understand different styles. That's the fun for us, is reflecting off what a, uh, what a client wants to have. Um, and again, here it was a, double, a large height space. My, the client said to me, I don't care if I sleep in a cupboard as long as I've got a fabulous drawing room. Um, and we didn't their bedroom in a cupboard, but we put the kitchen in a cupboard. So it's a sort of equivalent of the one that you saw before. Um, this front cupboard is actually made of MDF, still like anything else done in the other clients. Um, and it's been uh, mahoganized uh, to look older. And it's just a very charming space with pieces. And this, this flat has not changed. It's still the same now as it was then. Um, the photographs were syndicated 20 years ago around the world. Um, photographed by Andreas von Einseidel, who's one of the big um, photography stars, and he's still publishing these pictures. So it goes to show that when you work in not particularly classic, classic style like that, I mean, uh, uh, but even the modern style, if it's done in the right way, it's going to last you a lifetime. Um,
Now, it's again similar with this client, in so much as you're dealing with um, old, space, uh, old spaces and reflecting them in a new way. Um, it's a little bit like uh, Thomas Heatherwick's cold one, dare I compare myself to him, but you know, how he's approached something in a new way, but something that we actually recognize. Um, and taking here, which is a lateral conversion, meaning a conversion of a flat that goes over two, two houses in Kensington, it's as grand as you can get. Um, these spaces are literally ballrooms. Um, and then bringing those into something that feels a little bit cozy and a little bit warm and inviting. Um, and doing classic things like sticking jib doors in the back. Um, a lot of uh, handmade furniture, Minotti sofas, B&B chairs, the classics, frankly. A um, little bit of care about what the client owns themselves, displaying their art very well. Um, this is a, an installation that goes all along with a fireplace stuck in the middle. Um, it hides TVs, it's got sliding doors, etc. And it's just those, even in the big houses, those tiny little details. And um, David Hicks, I mean, the classic interior designer from 20, 30 years ago now, always talked about tablescapes. And it's that, just that little attention that always works, even if you haven't put flowers in, into a project. But the point I wanted to get onto this project as well, I mean, this is quite, it's been around for a while, this one, um, was a different approach to uh, the way that th we design. Um, in so, much, in so much bathrooms, I still see it now. Um, bathrooms, people think that it's a door in a wall, it's a square little room, you go in there, a blued, come back out, rather unpleasant little experience, frankly, and you've got one of those nasty little extractor fans buzzing in the corner. Um, and they have, you know, those new developments where they call them en suites, my God, and they're tiny. Um, you know, um, so we changed that a little bit. We had this big space, and we got, we, we made, we helped you flow through that space. You can see it's just one big box with an open top, um, loo and shower on the on the side. And because it's raised, we've been able to drop the the loo into a floor. You can see the room. Um, the glass is electronic, uh, so you can press a button. It's actually the bed head. Um, you can press a button and see through the window um, as well. So you're just opening up uh, the, the bathroom into the bedroom. They're beginning to integrate. And I think that we're beginning to see that in magazines now, that people are taking this idea on board. And, and with this client, I just gently nudged him into this direction, that this could be on the basis that we had this big, beautiful space that we didn't want to block up with the bathroom. Um, and it consequently, at the back, because we sit in that bathroom in there, we, we created this long corridor in the hallway, um, which we barrel vaulted just to bring the space down a little bit because it would have been a bit too, too tall. And I know it's a bit naff, but I couldn't resist it. I had to do that. And we'll have one of those electronic chain, color changing machines going on too. Um, and also, the same project, load ceiling, because it's underneath where the um, boiler and et cetera is, is you can make things look really expensive. I mean, I think that looks really glam glammy. I mean, that's for me is sort of private jet sort of stuff. But actually, the reality is not. Um, the, the tables from Dwell uh, cost me about 200 pounds. The fabric is bought from Portobello Road at eight pounds a meter. Um, that beautiful leather looking look is actually wallpaper that's been varnished over. Um, you can get the look. The only thing that is really quite expensive is, is the, is the Mies van der Rohe chair sitting in the middle. But I think the trick is, is not pushing the furniture up against the wall. It's, it's giving it air and space and putting it into the center of the room, saying, look, we can do. <coughs> also, for me, the future, going back to the future of design, um, the future of design is actually looking at the people, when you're working on site, is actually looking at the people that you're working with on site. Because, after all, I can draw lots of pretty pictures in my office, but um, I de I'm dependent on the guys building it on site. Um, and actually, you take a lot of advice from these guys. If you've got a good team, um, they come up with solutions. Uh, on this building site, this is actually a bathroom that's sitting there, and I couldn't get the soil pipe in from... I had to, I had to drain a, bar, uh, a shower um, down through into the middle of the building, and I couldn't get the soil pipe through. Um, and the... Um, the plumber on site worked out how to do that. Um, I had no idea. I was actually risking it a bit, not, actually, not knowing before I went on site. So they are useful. But the problem I'm finding in, in 
uh, it's a bit of a whine here, I'm afraid to say, but the problem I'm finding in central London is there aren't enough decent builders. And if you object with one, um, they will go, they will leave you, um, and they'll go to another project. And I'm always on the constant hunt for decent guys. And they don't come from this country anymore. And actually, I don't really care. Um, they can come from anywhere they want to come from, as long as they're good. Um, but perhaps we should be reintroducing, like they have in France and Germany, a proper apprenticeship system, which is recognizable. Um, we're getting to the stage where it seems to be a shame in this country to work with your hands. Um, yet there's a great beauty in it. Um, I've been reading that the schools no longer have metalwork and woodwork as part of the curriculum. What on earth's going on? Are we just going to become a group, uh, a bunch of computer programmers? Uh, it, it doesn't seem to go anywhere. So if there's my plea for the future is please can we have apprenticeships back? Um, and when you get apprenticeships back and skilled people, they turn that into that. Um, and that is my imagination and a client's, fab a, a builder's fabulous ability. This is actually cantilevered out of the wall. It's absolutely totally floating and not touching anything. Um, you could stand on that, on that, on that vanity unit. I, because the building is listed, I wasn't allowed to touch anything. I wasn't allowed to fit anything into it or cut anything in. And we thought we'd have a bit of fun with it. But I can specify and I can have a structural engineer work it out with me, but someone's got to build that thing for me. Um, actually, just touching also onto this project, because this was a young couple uh, who didn't know the parameters of each other. They'd only been married a couple of years, and you find that quite a lot. Um, but they had style, um, but very separate styles. Uh, but we did define and encourage them to commission. Um, and there's a, there's a lot, as you can see, there's a lot of handwork work going on on that picture, on, on that image, including sort of floating wall, handmade bed, British upholstery, Vera Glamise, which is this sort of gilding on glass using acid on, on that wall there. It's not a wardrobe, actually. It opens inwards, and then you've got a, a walk-in wardrobe and the, and the bathroom beyond. And we also encourage them to, they're a little bit old-fashioned for 30-year-olds, so we, um, very rich 30-year-olds, um, we, so we got them to combine uh, old and new as well, got them to go for Tom Dixon furniture, siren and table, even though we're going for a classic conservatory. Um, but there were moments which were quite difficult. I mean, I spent a lot of time with them, but it was quite difficult because if you've got a pair of a young couple together who don't know the parameters, you'll end up landing in a quagmire of beige, I can promise you. Um, and luckily, enough, her, uh, we discovered that her husband was slightly colorblind, so I could at, at least lie a little bit and manage to get sort of a sea, sea green out of, out of, out of the space. Um, it's all well made, it's all fine, but frankly, I, it's a bit boring. It's, it's nice, but it's a bit boring. Um, so we needed to make them move ahead a little bit. So what I did is I split them. I stopped them talking to each other at meetings. I had meetings with one or the other. And Okay, we've been a little bit sexist, but we, get, we gave her her own bathroom and, and worked on as girly a bathroom as we wanted and didn't care. And it was really fun to do. Um, and we managed to source uh, a young lady who, uh, on these walls, this isn't a, it's not a wallpaper. She actually sourced vintage wallpapers, cut them up and sewed them onto modern vinyls to create this almost tattoo working around the room. It's absolutely stunning. Um, 50s chandelier, again, it's Vera Glamise, that's um, silver gilding on glass, and then we hang a mirror on top of it. I mean, it's ex as exuberant as you want it to be. And I feel, compared to the last picture, that we started to get something that was a little bit more exciting. And again, yeah, totally sexist, he got the TV room, of course. Blokes like big TVs, so you just gotta buy into the fact, you know? And, uh, and so, we did in a very masculine room, uh, pony skin wallpaper, uh, big L-shaped sofas, so ch coffee tables of desire to put your feet up, and lots of places to put DVDs, etc. And he loved it. Um, so I kept both of them very happy, um, and uh, no ensuing divorce happened, and, and, and they've got a house that they can live in for a long time, exactly what it is. I mean, they're starting their family life in this house. And consequently, um, their trust gained in me. Um, 
They did a couple of mistakes. They did pop out to one, oh, shall I tell you who it is? Yes, small burn of devices, I've just said it, okay, um, uh, to do their library. And it was sheer hell. When you see a cornice banging into, into the side of an architrave because they just don't care, it's not bespoke. Um, and they know that once it was installed. I think they just had a, too many glasses of red wine on a Saturday afternoon and bought it. Um, but, so they realized you can't go and buy style. You have to put it together. Um, and I said to them, you have to commission. Because if you commission something, you'll keep it for life. It'll stick by you because it belongs to you. It's ingrained in you. Um, and we created this bar for them with this sorry, very small David Hicks up, um, upholstery nailed front onto a leather. It's copper gilding in the back. The doors slide in the side. We had this guy from Japan do proper Japan lacquer on around the edges, uh, silver gilding on the feet. It's exquisite. Um, I won't tell you how much it cost, but I'll give you an idea that, do you know how much, you know, you know the Hermes Birkin bag? You, would you know how much you would pay, for, how much would you pay for a Birkin bag? 10? Well, it was less than that. So, you know, it's not that bad. Also, I mean, in, in, uh, one of the beauties of working in London is, is you get a lot of people from abroad um, uh, coming over to London, and, and my job is to interpret uh, what they, uh, bringing their style and bringing a little bit of urban, maybe London style in with it too. This guy was obviously from, was from India, uh, quite special. We gilded walls. He had a great collection of art. Um, we actually lit up the top of that unit there. Um, he had a bar, but of this, he was Sikh, so that was fine, apparently. I think that's right. Um, uh, but what was quite nice is he, when we finished this project, he put that little Sikh god on the top, which gave him, him ownership of this project. And it's very much as a designer that you don't go in barging in and, and wanting it to be all about you, but it's actually the success is actually have the client feel that it belongs to them. And actually also with families, I... Um, I, I find you know, a lot of families get dominated by their kids. Uh, their toys are everywhere, um, and their life is ruled by them. And it's how the world seems to have changed. And uh, yes, I do get a lot of yummy mummies in what they call the Nappy Valley down in Wandsworth. Um, and they all tell me that they're all different from each other. Um, well, um, I think there might be a Wandsworth couple there. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, this couple wanted to have their own life as well. So what we did is they've got rooms where they can put their toys, but obviously there's some sort of playroom on the ground floor. But at night, they can go into their living room and put all these toys away and just can act like grown-ups without everything around. <clears throat> and there's another little point that I want to just make about moving on into, into the future, which um, this image is reminding me of because this is probably the opposite. This is a client, a project I did some time ago, beautiful layering. Um, it doesn't all bought from one period, from one location. Um, uh, it, we had time to pull that project together because I pulled this house to bits. Like you saw that first slide, there was nothing. And we put it so that we could slowly build up this project. Um, this is what, six, seven years ago, we spent 1.2, 1.3 million pounds on this project. But even these people do something a little bit naughty. Um, a little bit naughty that some the government's been having words about, um, saying it's morally wrong to pay cash to your builder. Now, it's sheer hell for me. I try not to know about it. I did actually once have um, a contractor come, a nice Irish guy, come and meet the client before we set off on the project, because it was the last, first and last time we'd meet them because they were moving out. And this lovely Irish chap didn't say very much during the meeting until he was about to leave. And he said to my client, he said, and I won't do the Irish accent, but he said, sir, uh, don't forget if you pay me cash, we can avoid the VAT. What he didn't realize, he was actually talking to the Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time. Um, I wanted to fall in a hole. Um, uh, and uh, it was Christopher Waldegrave. Um, but there is another step we could take, surely. Um, what I'm finding is these people paying cash have got their hands tied because they can't sign a JCT contract. If the builder goes wrong, how, try suing him when you've paid cash. So how do we pay people, encourage people 
to pay the VAT and actually go through building regulations. Well, maybe we should encourage them by giving them a bit of a discount. If you go through building regs, if you've signed a JCT contract, perhaps give them 50% discount on the VAT, which means the government is going to get a lot more money than it is now, um, and the consumer is protected because we're finding a lot of um, cowboy builders out there that people are getting too tempted to take on board. That's my rant for the afternoon. <coughs> um, now, the, I, I put the before on this, okay, uh, because I got a phone call from a client. He just married a lovely Chinese girl. Um, he rang me and he said, uh, I've got a flat in Holland Park. It's really nice. She refuses to come and stay. And I don't understand why, because I interior designed it myself. I mean, I was doing that when he was saying it to myself. Um, but actually, when you look at it, it's not bad. It's what most people live in, isn't it? Actually, it's probably better than what most people live in. It's got a nice dining table. It's very clean. Um, but we did sort it out a little bit. And there you go. Same room. So tell me that an interior designer hasn't got a job, you know? Um, and we've moved it, centered it up a little bit, put glass um, balustrades so that it's, it's widened the room. We got rid of the dining table. Who eats at home in central London, for goodness sake, only for a takeaway, you know, or a bit from Waitrose? So we've reduced the dining room table size down and had some fun with it. Um, another view. And there it is now. We took this picture on Friday, um, which is only yesterday, actually. Um, <coughs> Little fireplace, little touches of China, um, without being too obvious. Um, I mean, I'm a bit lazy. I did Google it, sort of red, black lacquer, round circles, sort of Chinese feel. Um, but also aware that, um, that it, um, with Feng Shui, and Feng Shui has got quite a lot of lo logic to it, is it's bad luck to be able to see a TV. I think it's always bad luck to see a TV in a room. Um, so we've hidden it in a panel on that raised, raised panel at the back there. Backlit it to make it look glamorous. Black lacquer units at the front on either side, which has got all the DVDs and goodness knows what in it. And we've dropped the rug, little tip, we've dropped the rug into the wood and floor so you don't spend your life tripping over it. Oh, love that room. It's my favorite room. The bit that you can't see is opposite the loo is a mirror, full length, all the wall. What joy. Can you imagine? You know. Anyway, so we had a little go at that one too. And stuck with the black lacquer, there's these very shiny black tiles, red tiles, round mirror. And I think this is fine. The bedroom. Um, also, I mean, you can see it is a general, it's a small flat. It's in the eaves of the building. Great location, great view at the back, but not a great flat in its own right. And that's what we did with it. Um, it's... I mean, it's a bit hotel spec. It was done on a budget. It was still a budget. Um, but what was quite magical for us was we've taken the doors all the way up to the ceiling. And, and you can see there's no, there's no crossbar. There's no architrave door lining going over across. We've got rid of door linings it's, uh, of architraves. It's just a little shadow gap which you address the wallpaper to. It's a nice little detail. And it's quite simple to do if you're putting new doors in. And it just makes the whole space flow. And moving on into the future in my own office, it took me years to go into AutoCAD, you know, drawing on computers, because I'm trained to draw by hand. Um, and I still, attack, um, I still attack the wall with a pencil, um, if I'm really honest. Uh, sorry, attack the, the computer screen with a pencil, uh, which sends everybody mad in the office. But what we are doing as well is now trying to help our clients along. It's quite astonishing that people cannot visualize a drawing. Um, but it's true. Actually, I did have a, a client call the other day and said, I can't read the 3D visual of the staircase. And you're thinking, how do you not read the 3D visual? But anyway, it happens. So we do start to sort of color them in and make them work. Um, on this plan, actually, you're seeing, again, we're flowing the bathroom into the bedroom space. Um, this apartment, we're just starting work on it. It's fabulous. It looks over Tower Bridge with a view of the Shard as well. Um, and. Uh, that's what we also do is these 3Ds where we Photoshop um, items into it to help people see what they might be getting. And that really helps us because it gets rid of the fear so that we can um, 
push and nudge a little bit more in the design side of things. Let people be a little bit more daring with what they've got, because they won't be bored with it. I mean, this client came to me with her Kelly Hoppen book in her hand, and sort of was virtually asking me to copy her. Now, I'm sure Kelly's fantastic, but she ain't me, you know? And uh, I wanted to give her something special and belong to her. Um, this is just a view from the bathroom. Um, and at the same time, just to contrast my work at the moment, I'm working on a 14th century um, uh, chateau in the south of France. Sheer joy, frankly, but also a very difficult space to work with when you're dealing with rock, stone. Uh, the bathroom's going in a turret. And we're trying just to come to terms with it and get the client to understand and find their design. Very strong clients, very successful uh, international people based in London, great fun, and they want to define their style. And actually working what this style is done in the south of France without going for that shabby chic sort of thing that everybody seems to do in French grey. Um, and doing these 3Ds is helping us move in that direction. This is the turreted bathroom. Um, and this is a, uh, the po we're looking at the, considering the possibilities of how the bed addresses the wall. And this is all done with photoshopping. Um, so this is a, a fabulous Timorous Breesties fabric that we've got on. on, a, on um, it's an Anso to bed. bed. Um, and all this boils down also to um, uh, an, institu an institute that I'm part of, the British Institute of Interior Design. Um, I'm the director there of uh, Continuous Professional Development. Um, and it's quite a serious setup. Uh, it's, it's, where, it's where we're looked after, essentially. It's where we go and learn about what's new, what's the regulations, uh, health and safety, quite boring things like that, building regs, lighting regs, um, and also just the network as well. It's, a, it's, 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 it's quite a lot of fun. Um, if, you're, if you're out there as a possible client, I would suggest that you look for that sign when you look for, uh, look for an interior designer, because you know then that they're fully insured and also fully trained. Um, so it's, 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 it's an essential part of looking out for, uh, for a designer. <clears throat> so I, really, I mean, I've come to the end of the, of, of the talk, um, but as you can see, what the point I'm getting at is just uh, for the future, is to attain a future uh, that is better made, but we're following in the same style and angle that we are doing now, but getting things that actually people like as an individual rather than being a sort of dedicated follower.